check, check, mic check, 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 mic check. <laughs> Welcome to Podcast Envy. I'm your podcast boss, Andrea Klender, and today we are talking all about podcasting for nonprofit organizations. Now, if you are not affiliated with a nonprofit organization, then you can skip this episode. No, wait, just kidding. Don't skip this episode because you are going to meet the hosts of some really incredible podcasts that are coming from nonprofit organizations. And hey, you never know when these tips that they have to share with us are going to come in handy. So why are we talking about podcasting for nonprofit organizations? Well, because there is a huge trend right now in podcasting. It seems like everyone is starting a podcast these days and it's not just trendy because nonprofit organizations, by definition, have an obligation to have an educational and community outreach or civic engagement mission. And I don't know about you, but I certainly learn a lot from listening to podcasts. So what better platform for a nonprofit organization charged with education, community outreach, and civic engagement than a podcast? And I have firsthand experience with this. At the beginning of this year, 2018, I landed my dream contract. I was hired to produce and edit a podcast for the Santa Fe Opera, a nonprofit organization, through their education and community outreach department. They had and have a big vision for the type of storytelling that they wanted to create. And this is not just storytelling for storytelling's sake, and it's not just podcasting for promoting the Santa Fe Opera. They are working on an initiative to commission and produce brand new operas that help level the playing field in the industry for underrepresented voices in the world of opera. So not only is it a behind-the-scenes podcast looking at the commissioning and production process of creating these new operas, but we are also delving into themes of diversity, inclusion, and how the Me Too movement and the Time's Up movement both impact the world of opera. And they had a really specific vision that they knew they could not create on their own because they are employees of a nonprofit arts organization who have a million and five responsibilities that have nothing to do with producing a podcast. So they brought me on board and we completed season one of Key Change, Creating Opera for All Voices, available wherever you're listening to this podcast, and are currently in production for season two, which I am so excited about. So I have become really curious about how nonprofits can utilize this incredible medium to extend their reach beyond their geographical location and beyond their traditional outreach methods and how they can do it well and how I can help support nonprofits in their vision through my work as a podcast producer, editor, and consultant. Also, you may be a subscriber to Podcast Envy, and perhaps you already heard my interview with Beth O'Connor from The Rural Health Voice in episode 28. And Beth, at the time that I spoke with her, was just at the very beginning of her podcast journey. In fact, as you're listening to this episode, the Rural Health Voice is either pending approval from Apple Podcasts or has been approved and is live. So go look for it. And after that conversation, I thought it would be really smart to reach out to some other podcasts that are created by and supporting different nonprofit organizations to see what their challenges are what success looks like for them, and what tips they have for nonprofit organizations who are considering a podcast. And again, let me just say, if you are not affiliated with a nonprofit organization, there is still so much good advice here in this episode that you are not going to want to miss it. For the purposes of this episode, I spoke with Jenny Wetter, Director of Public Policy at the Population Institute in Washington, D.C. The mission of the Population Institute is to improve the health and well-being of people and the planet by supporting policies and programs that promote sexual and reproductive health and rights. They build support for those policies and programs by educating policymakers, the media, and the general public. No big deal, right? big mission. The name of their podcast is Repros Fight Back. 
I also spoke with Alexis Brown of My Ocean Podcast on behalf of OceanWise, a global nonprofit based in Vancouver, Canada. The focus for OceanWise is probably no surprise, ocean conservation, and they are based in the Vancouver Aquarium. We also received a special treat of audio feedback so that you will hear directly from Jenna Spinelli of Democracy Works from the McCourtney Institute for Democracy at Penn State University. And we heard from the whole team at The Gifted Life, Lori Steele, Joey Boudreau, and Sally Gentry. The Gifted Life features entertaining and informative conversations about organ, tissue, and eye donation and transplantation, and they are based in Louisiana. Let's hear a little bit more of the story behind Democracy Works from Jenna and then from The Gifted Life. My name is Jenna Spinelli, and I am one of the hosts of Democracy Works, a podcast produced by the McCourtney Institute for Democracy at Penn State. The idea for Democracy Works was hatched on a car ride from our campus in Pennsylvania to Washington, D.C. last fall. I sat in the back seat listening to Chris Beam and Michael Berkman, who are now my co-hosts, talk about politics for about four hours straight and thought, yeah, we really need to get these guys on tape. And beyond that, we found that there was a a niche to be filled in terms of a nonpartisan political podcast. With Democracy Works, we're trying to take a look at issues that impact democracy in a way that rises above the daily news grind and helps people understand where we are, how we got here, and where we're going. Hey, we're excited to tell you about our podcast. It's called The Gifted Life, and we have conversations about organ, tissue, and eye donation. And we must say this is a team effort. I'm Lori. I'm Joey. I'm Sally. And of course, we have with us behind the scenes, Kirsten, Troy, and Shalon. We work for Louisiana Organ Procurement Agency, LOPA, and we are always looking for ways to educate the community about organ tissue and eye donation and transplantation. And we recognize that the podcasting world was a medium that was not touched. There were no podcasts about donation and transplant. So we figured, okay, we're going to get together to try to figure out what the podcast would look like, how long it would be, what areas we would focus on. We realized, you know, that we had certain things that we had to keep in each time. And then, of course, we started evolving, recognizing there were other areas that that maybe we weren't uh, focusing on that we needed to. And being a licensed professional counselor, working with donor families and with recipients also as they came together, communicating, wanting to meet, this was another avenue for us to be able to share how that works for families. And also we let folks know how we talk about different mental health issues that can be of support to individuals in the community. Yeah, so this is just another tool in our toolbox online. Folks can go there all the time to hear All of these topics and these partners that we partner with from across the country, which is amazing. My Ocean started because Alexis is part of the communications team at OceanWise. And last fall, she had the idea to start a podcast as another touchpoint for both their current audience and potential new followers. And it was pretty easy to get it approved because they already have a whole content team on staff and produce YouTube videos on their very own channel, which of course we will link in the show notes for this episode. Alexis said podcasting was a natural extension of their content media department because it's a great way for them to expand to reach a global audience. Podcasting has a proven growing market and it's a great way to tell extended long form stories. It also allows OceanWise to connect with like-minded organizations and individuals around the world who are also finding creative ways to conserve our oceans and who have their own unique story. Jenny from Repro's Fight Back has a similarly passionate origin story. She says, In Washington, D.C., around the U.S. and around the world, sexual and reproductive health and rights are under an unprecedented attack. So in that context, we decided to create a podcast called Repros Fight Back that keeps listeners informed on the critical fights and gives them the tools they need to take action and fight back. When Trump took office and it became clear that sexual and reproductive health and rights were going to be under attack, we started to think of new ways to fulfill the public education part of our mission. We decided that a podcast talking about all of these issues would be a great opportunity to educate people about everything going on and give us an opportunity to turn that anger into action. It's podcast angel time. And hey, y'all, 
New Year's Eve is just 14 weeks away. You know that dream you've had of launching a podcast in 2019 just in time for the new year? Well, there's still time to make it come true. Oh wait, that wasn't your dream? You were just hashtag asking for a friend? We'll tell them to head over to bit.ly forward slash launch pod envy to get the 411 on my brand new podcast envy launch pod. <laughs> designed to help you get your new show launched with confidence, ease, and a little creativity just in time for January with the support of a community. You only have until October 6th to inquire about this pod. Too much pressure? Your mind already in the winter holiday mode and feeling like there's no way you're ever going to get it done in 14 weeks? Never fear. Launch Pod 2 starts in January after all that hubbub dies down. So get on the priority registration list at bit.ly forward slash launch pod envy linked in the show notes for this episode with these grand diverse missions how do you measure roi or return on investment with a podcast often podcasters have little to go on fluctuating download numbers vague statistics and we have to pull teeth to engage with or learn about who is actually listening to our show. In order to justify the podcast as an asset to the organization, how are these organizations measuring success? For Repro's Fight Back, Jenny says, right now, they're focused on putting out quality episodes and the response from the audience versus focusing on numbers of listeners. Alexis from My Ocean says their growth in downloads and geographical reach is slow but still exciting. Other than that, success is measured by social media engagement on related posts on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, and then also by hearing from fans. They've received emails from listeners and pitches from publicists. All of that is encouraging. She also thinks that success can be indicated by the quality of guests that they have on, and they've been very lucky to land some big names and some exceptional people. Here's Joey from The Gifted Life. We focus a lot of our energy and efforts, obviously, toward community education. This fits right in line of what we're trying to do. Yeah, and guys, we're talking about the podcasting world. So we look at those downloads and we look at uh, where our episodes are being downloaded. But for us, uh, when we talk about, you know, is this working? It's the stories that we get. I mean, guys, we just heard from Jennifer. She was looking to be a living donor and her resource was what? The gifted life. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so we actually had an opportunity to talk to her. That was pretty neat. Yeah, it sure was. Yeah, actually, that was episode 87. Yeah. And and she has an incredible story. um, If you want to tune in and listen to that, we actually talked to her after the procedure. She is just a breath of fresh air, um, inspired us to, you know, to want to do more. That's why we do the podcast, right? Uh, We were also in a class, a community college. They're training nursing students. And what they said was they use the podcast as a training tool. The Gifted Life is just another resource for those students. Yeah, and along those lines, we've heard from many of our colleagues across the country that we work closely with. They use our podcasts in their orientation and training because it's so rich in content about the donation process. And there's so many different areas, you know, that we tackle. And another way that we reach out to the community is through multicultural episodes. And one of them we had was done in Spanish. It was very interesting in the fact that we do have a number of donors who are Hispanic. And so to be able to reach out to these communities, the whole episode, which is episode number 86, was dedicated to the Hispanic communities. In the six months since we started producing Democracy Works, we've had listeners in 64 countries, which is just incredible to me. I think that there's a lot of interest in U.S. democracy around the world right now, and we feel great that we're able to meet the niche that we thought was there at the beginning and really see that the, um, evidence of that come through in our listeners. Sometimes success comes not in terms of numbers and downloads, but in the anecdotal evidence that what you're doing is making a real difference to someone. Alexis said that she received one email from a listener of My Ocean in the United States who said that she just discovered the podcast and it had already convinced her to change some of her behavior when it comes to plastic use and disposal. She says that's exactly what they're hoping to do. 
They also received an email from a composer in the UK who really liked the show and sent along some original music for them to use in upcoming episodes. It's a great feeling to know that OceanWise is getting some recognition outside of their home base of Canada. Alexis also mentioned that their guests have often been excited to share the episodes on their channels and that though there's never an expectation that they share, the fact that they enjoy the experience and the end result so much that they want to send it out to their audience is a really good thing. Similarly, Jenny from Repros also wanted to note that community building has been a huge side benefit of the podcast. She said that it's been really important that they got buy-in right away from various reproductive health and rights organizations that they partner with. So with all of this good mojo coming from the podcasts, what about the challenges? I personally would have thought that funding the podcasts would have been a challenge, but that turns out not to be the case for these nonprofits. How do we do it when it comes to funding? Really, LOPA absorbs the cost because we see the value in that community education. We were very lucky when we started the podcast uh, six months ago to receive some seed funding from a friend of the McCourtney Institute. And we're now in the process of applying for a grant through Penn State. And, you know, podcasts are really taking off in higher ed right now. And I think there's money to be had for anyone out there whose podcast is based at a college or university. Uh, I would definitely encourage you to look at your center for teaching and learning and innovation or whatever that, that might be called at your institute. But, you know, organizations like that are looking to support podcasts because of their potential for lifelong learning and use in the classroom. So if funding isn't the biggest challenge, what is? In my interview in the last episode with Beth O'Connor from the Rural Health Voice, she talked about how she took on this challenge of starting a podcast at the suggestion of her board president with very little experience or knowledge about podcasting. And let's keep in mind that until recently, she was actually a nonprofit office of one with no staff to lean on amongst her other responsibilities. In fact, her experience points to the two challenges that present a consistent through line for most nonprofits who want to podcast. As Jenny says for Repros Fight Back, one is technical difficulties. The other big area where we had issues was around underestimating the time commitment needed. Does that sound familiar? My Ocean already had the tech team and the facility in-house for their YouTube channel, so tech wasn't really a problem, but that didn't necessarily help with the time crunch. Alexis says, quote, it is not my full-time job or even my part-time job, and most of the production is done outside of work hours. Similarly, my editor often listens to the episodes early morning before the workday starts. Certainly, we're getting better at streamlining as time goes on, but it's still consuming. Here's Jenna. Our biggest challenge uh, is the time it takes to plan, record, produce, and promote episodes. I, I don't think we're alone in that by any means. Like a lot of other uh, nonprofits and similar organizations, the podcast is just one of many activities that our institute does. But, you know, it really could easily be a full-time job for everyone involved. And we're always looking for ways to be more efficient so that we can produce a, a quality show without being something that, that takes up every minute of everyone's time all day. So that's a, a struggle for us and something that um, I'm looking to hear um, hopefully some, some best practices or tips from other people who are involved in this episode. Sorry, Jenna, we still haven't solved the time crunch problem yet. Other than hiring a podcast boss like me to take some of the post-production editing and publishing work off your hands, <clears throat> but besides time, and once you've gotten over the tech hurdle, what else? Alexis says discovery, which most podcasters would probably mention. In fact, there have been articles and blogs and videos galore on the topic of discovery. And with more and more podcasts entering the directories every day, it can be hard to stand out. She's optimistic, though, that their niche and their mission are strong enough that with time and as people become increasingly aware and into ocean issues, my ocean will gain a greater audience. And here's yet another challenge that the gifted life has been dealing with. In fact, you could say it's both a strength and a challenge. So yeah, we try to uh, keep the topics wide. We try to keep it national, international. We've had uh, Canadian, we've had 
you know, address other international issues and topics, which is also one of our biggest challenges that we've had throughout the podcast. I would have to say, you know, initially technical difficulties was was one of our challenges, but then right, remember once, that first episode? Oh my god. <laughs> yeah, our first episode and then we had one where we we did it remotely and it sounded like there was a helicopter above our head the whole time. We've gotten all that ironed out, but our true challenge now is keeping the content fresh enough so that we've got outsiders who have no ties to donation interested in donation. Because like I mentioned earlier with the colleagues that, uh, and you mentioned the, the nursing students that have ties, but we're trying to reach with a population that has no ties, no reasons to listen, and we're trying to get them interested in donation. Yeah. And hopefully will inspire them to act to become registered right. organ, tissue, and eye donors, which you can do at registerme.org. So if you're listening to this episode and you are in some way affiliated with a nonprofit organization thinking, gosh, we should really have our own podcast too. First of all, I agree wholeheartedly. And if you want a complimentary consultation to talk through some of your ideas, please reach out to me at Andrea at thecreativeimposter.com or click the contact page on my website. In any case, here are some parting words of advice from our nonprofit podcast panel for today's episode. Say that five times fast. But wait, before I get to the advice, I want to say a huge thank you to Jenna, Alexis, Jenny, Lori, Joey, Sally, and the production teams behind these podcasts that are truly making a difference in the world. Please give them a listen, subscribe, and maybe even leave a review on Apple Podcasts or your favorite listening app. Ooh, or even better, listen on Spotify and share an episode right from Spotify to your Instagram story, if you're into Instagram stories. Then you can tag the show that you're listening to and tag me at Andrea Clunder so we know you're listening. You can find Repros Fight Back at reprosefightback.com on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Jenny says... We're a small office, so it was really helpful for us to use outside help when setting everything up. They were able to recommend equipment, set it up, and train me on how to use everything. It was so helpful to have them. Last, believe in your idea and don't let anyone sway you from it. My Ocean and OceanWise can be found at ocean.org and on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram as Ocean Wise Life. Alexis's advice is do the research on what's already out there on relevant topics and then find your own way to tell your story. I think you also need to find a balance between promoting your own work and that of others. I know I wouldn't listen to a podcast if it was just a company or nonprofit talking about the work that they do. For nonprofits in particular, there are ways to do it that aren't even going to break the budget And there are lots of great forums online that provide advice on how to do just that. It was also a really steep learning curve. So the beginning was tough and a bit overwhelming because no one here had specifically launched a podcast like this before, but it's gotten easier for sure. Democracy Works can be found at democracyworkspodcast.com and on Facebook and Twitter. Here's advice from Jenna. My best advice for an organization considering their own podcast is just to jump in and try it. I think a lot of nonprofits and organizations in higher ed tend to get caught up in the the planning process so much that they never actually get anything off the ground. But with a podcast, there's little cost and little risk associated with making a pilot episode or two to see if it's something that you enjoy. That's what we did. And hearing that first episode come together was part of what made us so excited to officially launch and what's really kept our uh, momentum going throughout the process. And I would also say to just make sure that everyone involved in the podcast is clear about what the goals and objectives are for doing it. If everyone's not on the same page, you're going to find that you waste a lot of time and energy trying to to make everyone happy or, or trying to achieve multiple goals and the quality of your show is going to suffer as a result. So I would definitely recommend, you know, locking in whatever that North Star is going to be for the team that's involved with your podcast and, you know, do some research as well to to make sure that you are meeting a a unique niche in the market. There's not someone else out there already who's doing a show that's exactly the same as the one you want to produce. The Gifted Life is at thegiftedlife.org and on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. 
all shows, of course, will be linked up in the show notes for this episode at podcastnv.com, or you can go directly to bit.ly, that's bit.ly forward slash pod envy 029 for episode 29. And here is our parting piece of advice from the whole team at The Gifted Life. The bottom line, I think, is you got to be passionate about the topic that you're talking about. You have to be surrounded by a good team. I love mm-hmm. you guys. Mm-hmm. Oh, we love you too. Didn't pay them to do that. <laughs> but uh, you spend so much time together and this is kind of our baby and it's been you know, growing for, for three and a half years and we're excited to see where it goes. We do that as a team. We hope that you check it out. It's called The Gifted Life. A special thanks to Podcast Envy for giving us this opportunity. We appreciate it. Thank you. Podcast Envy is produced by your podcast boss, Andrea Klunder. That's me. The Podcast Envy theme music is by Valentin Sosnitsky, courtesy of the Free Sound Project at freesound.org. And our podcast angel music is by Benjamin Masterpolito, also on freesound.org as Lemon Cream. All music is licensed under the Creative Commons. Our episodes are mixed by Edwin Ruiz. And hey, if you want your show to sound as good as ours, hire us. Put the magic audio mojo of the Creative Imposter Studios to work for you. Thanks so much for listening, and here's to making your podcast the envy of everyone else.